Good morning, everyone. I'm going to pinch plan a little bit because I'm having some back issues at the moment, but I try not to be in front of the slides. Um, so as Sarah mentioned, I'm going to be talking about adaptogens. I'm going to be talking about what adaptogens are, what they do, and why they're so supportive of good health. And then we're going to conclude the talk about, as Sarah mentioned, talking about three specific adaptogen-rich products that Isogenics has to target whatever may ail you. Okay. So, and, uh, and I'm also going to touch base on some historical context of adaptogenic research. And, and you probably wonder why I'm going to talk about history a little bit. Two reasons. The history of adaptogens is very interesting, first of all. It's a great story. But moreover, it has direct relevance to sort of how adaptogens came from where they were to isogenics. So if you bear with me, it won't be painful. I think you'll enjoy the I'll talk. Keep it going. <laughs> okay, so the first question we get here, and we get it very frequently at isogenics, is what are adaptogens? Okay? Adaptogens are natural substances in a, in a relatively rare number of plants and herbs. Okay, we'll start there. They're natural substances in plants, right? But that doesn't narrow it down at all. There are millions, millions of compounds in plants. Adaptogens have to fulfill a certain criteria to be considered adaptogens, okay? And these are the main criteria. They have to be able to reduce stress-induced damage, regardless of what the stress is. They have to be able to support physical and mental performance, okay? Number three, they have to normalize body systems and pathways. And you notice that I have the word normalize highlighted and bolded. That's a key word when you're talking about adaptogens, is normalizing or normalization. Okay, and I'll get back to that word at the very end of my talk. And fourth and finally, adaptogens have to be proven to be remarkably safe and non-toxic to the system. And most of this work, of course, has been done in, in animal studies, but some of it has now been done in humans. Okay, but this is the criteria for adaptogens. Okay? And, and not that many things fulfill this criteria. But what does fill this criteria are certain plants and herbs. And these are four major adaptogenic plants and herbs that we utilize in isogenics. Okay, that have been shown to increase health and wellness. So we have ashwagandha, also known as Indian ginseng. We have rhodiola. Okay, we have Shizandra berry, also called, or the technical name is Shizandra chinensis. And then the fourth adaptogen we talk about and have done a lot of research with is Siberian ginseng, okay, or Lutrococcus epitosis. You might see that word a lot in our adaptogenic products. And this isn't the whole list either. There's a lot of different adaptogens, but these are the four major players and the ones that have a lot of the science behind them. Speaking of science, um, why don't we talk about that a little bit? Or what, what's the history of adaptogens? Where do they come from? Okay, I'm going to back up a tiny bit and just throw a question out to the audience at this point. So, let me ask you guys this, and I'm looking for basically a one-word answer. Why would plants need to have adaptogens? Survive. Survival's good. I was looking for stress, but survival is apropos. Okay, so think about it. Plants have evolved for hundreds of millions of years to be able to withstand their surroundings, to be able to survive. Okay? Now, what are, what are they surviving from? Well, they could be surviving from predators, of course, bugs, insects, etc. They could be surviving from chemicals in their surroundings, air, soil, etc. But when you think about survival and stress among plants, you should think about environmental stress, right? And that's what adaptions are there for in the plants. They're helping the plant to survive, to adapt. It's not surprising that the first five letters of adaptogens is adapt, okay? So, and why would they need to adapt? Well, look at what plants are exposed to. Different extremes of temperature, okay? Different extremes of moisture or rainfall. Altitude, you have plants that grow in the mountains that have a lot less oxygen to pull, okay? So adapting to the plants for a reason, to help them survive stress, environmental stressors. So the obvious question would be, what about animals? What about us? And the research so far suggests that yes, just like in plants, even though humans are not plants in most cases, 
I've met plenty of people who have a personality of plants. <laughs> but in, in human studies also, we've seen the same kind of effects where adaptogens can improve performance and help manage stress. So I'm going to go to the next slide. And as Sarah mentioned, I always like to talk about history and context and things like that when I give a presentation, because I think the stories are important and they're interesting. So I scoured the internet to look up original adaptogenic research, and I came across this document from the former Soviet Union. I'm gonna get, my, get out my little highlighter. I'm from academia, so I like to use the highlighter a lot. And so you see that this is from 1943, Soviet Union, former Soviet Union, during World War II, which is not insignificant for this point. And this says, this document to study Shizandra with the purpose of finding tonic substances. So the Russians were all over adaptogen starting in World War II. And you'll also notice the name of the dictator, Joseph Stalin, <laughs> and you have what apparently might be the two first publications of adaptogen research. In this case, again, with Shizandra in Russian. I wish someone could come up to me and interpret that for me. I'd love to know what it says. But again, it's, nice. it's World War II. Russians were all over adaptogens. They knew there was something to these compounds and from plants. And you'll also see here this name, Lazarev. Okay? So Nikolai Lazarev was the main first scientist to look into adaptogens in Russia. So if we fast forward about 10 years, about 1957 or so, Dr. Lazarev says to his subordinate, he says, I want you to take over the adaptogenic research and I want you to scour all the plants from Siberia on the one end to India on the other end, and we're going to investigate whatever it takes to look into adaptogens and how they can help our citizenry. Okay? So that takes us to this gentleman. And I hope there's some James Bond fans here to understand this reference. <laughs> Maybe not, I don't know. So that takes us to this gentleman, Dr. Israel Breckman. Dr. Breckman is a renowned Russian physiologist pharmacologist. He's considered the father of adaptogenic research. Okay, so this is the, this is the man, Dr. Israel Breckman. So from about 1961 to his death 20 years ago, he was the man studying adaptogens in Russia and then eventually outward, as we'll talk about in a moment. So, who were adaptogens for in Russian society? Well, they were for the elites. So the political elites were using the adaptogens, right? The soldiers were using adaptogens. Remember I said this is during World War II earlier. Um, cosmonauts were using adaptogens. And then you had sort of the, the middleman of society. You had the long distance truck drivers wanted to stay awake, wanted to be alert, wanted to improve their mental performance or capacity. Olympians were using them as well. Athletes. You stole my thunder again. Sorry. <laughs> no, but that's right. Also, Olympians. Which brings me to my next slide. So, as Sarah just mentioned, we also had Olympians using adaptogens routinely. Now, I'm sure most of you in the audience are not as old as I am, and you probably don't remember, but 40 years ago or so, I used to watch ABC's Wide World of Sports. I remember vividly this man, Alexeyev, on TV, breaking world records left and right, okay? And that was something. And so, about 25 years ago, for those of you who don't remember, the Soviet Union collapsed. All this adaptogenic information that was sort of bottled up in Russia at the time started spilling over to the Western societies, including America, of course. And one of the things that came out when the Soviet Union collapsed was that the Soviet Olympic coach, who was training all the athletes, we'd be asking, or Westerners would be asking him, why were you Soviet, or Russian, you know, at this point, why were you Russian athletes so dominant for decades in like power sports, and the Olympics, and certain events, things like that? And the Olympic coach would say, among other things, we were using a lot of adaptogens to increase mental performance, physical performance, and to help manage stress. These were just routine part of the training program for these elite athletes. Okay, so a few years after that, we had a meeting of the minds, East and West, you could say. So sometime around 20 years ago, this famous picture here of the father of adaptogens, Dr. Israel Breckman, and IGN's co-founder, Mr. Jim Coover, had a meeting. I don't know exactly when this was. I know it was at least 20 years ago, predating Isogenics, because Breckman died in 94, so I know it was before that. I also don't know where this has taken place. I jokingly said before that maybe it was like a laundromat or something. <laughs> I thought it might have been like a dryer, I don't know. 
<laughs> but I'm sure it was a lab somewhere, right? And so even before isogenic, you can see the interest between the father of adaptogens and adaptogenic research and the co-founder of isogenics. So that's my story. That's my sort of my historical context about how isogenics came to use and utilize the beneficial effects of adaptogens in our products. And I hope that wasn't too hard for you, and I hope it wasn't too boring for you, but I think it's a really nice context to see how things go from A to B in this case. All right, let's get going. Um, so tell us about what's, what's the effect inside the body, right? What do they actually do inside the body? Okay. So how do adaptogens work? A very common, commonly asked question. Well, we don't know exactly how adaptogens work, okay? We really don't. But we have an idea how they work, or we know how they end up working. So, adaptogens work by providing anti-stress or stress management for the organism, whether it's a plant, whether it's an animal, humans, etc. Anti-stress, that's the major thing about adaptogens, okay? So if you look at this schematic representation that comes from a work of Dr. Panosian, who's the smartest person on the planet today with adaptogens, this is what he believes happens, how adaptogens work. So, in general, under conditions where you're not using adaptogens or not exposed to adaptogens, you have a stress response. Okay, so you have an immediacy of the stress response where it goes up. First of all, you're tired because you have to deal with the immediate stressor. You have a stress response that lingers on for some period of time, and then you have some degree of sort of crashing, basically. Okay? And then you see this phase here underneath the axis that's called exhaustion. That's, I call it, just sort of stressed out at that point. That's what this part here is, exhaustion. You're dealing with the stressor. It's taking its toll on you, okay? So this is under normal circumstances, but if you're using adaptogens, or if you have adaptogens in your system, and they're modulating your stress response, your curve will not look like this, it will look more like this, okay? So you can see right away, you have a little bit of stress resistance at the onset, so you're not quite as susceptible. You don't have this huge hyper response to the stressing agent. Okay, so you have more of an even keel approach here. So you're dealing with the stress normally. Which I hyper uh, hyper exposed here, and you're not crashing at all under normal circumstances. You're sort of going along and dealing with the stressor. Your sisters are dealing with the stressors. Your physiology is dealing with the stressors. And you'll notice there's no exhaustion phase here. It doesn't go below the axis. You're not spending all this energy sort of just dealing with the stress that's coming your way. And even here at the end, you're at a level of homeostasis that's a little better than it was to start with, okay? So the adaption, in a way, is sort of inoculating you to the next stressing agent that's coming your way the next day, the next week, or whatever. Now, if you want to move to sort of the real world situation, to go from the schematic representation of what we think is going on with adaptions to the real world effects of adaptogens in our overall health and wellness, I'm sorry, I want, this, is a, this is summarizing what I just said. So that is to decrease the resistance of, to stressors, which is shown here. It decreases the sensitivity to stressors, shown here. Greater equilibrium at, against stressors in the future, sort of inoculation, if you will, which is shown kind of here. And again, adapters are anti-stress, but they're not only anti-stress, as I mentioned, they're anti-fatigue, because you're not dealing with this exhaustion phase, okay? So this is sort of, you know, double whammy of adaptogens. Anti-stress, anti-fatigue. So, so let's look into the real world. Okay, why is stress so important? Okay, and why is the wrong kind of stress bad? So we're not talking about acute stress. We're not talking about the stress that I'm undergoing right now, speaking in front of all of you at 10.30 in the morning or whatever. That's the acute stress, that's fine. Or stress you might do by going out and running. That's good stress. That's healthy stress. We're talking about chronic stress, day after day, week after week, maybe year after year, of just stress beating down on you. That's chronic stress, and we all know that that's not good for your health. That's health draining. So, and why is stress so bad? Well, let's look through some of the pathways that are involved with the stress response. The first thing that happens when you're under stress, increase cortisol levels. That's our stress hormone. Now, cortisol is like, all other hormones in our bodies. You need it for life, but if it gets out of whack or you secrete too much of it, it's bad for your body, it's bad for your physiology, it's bad for your homeostasis, it's bad for all the other organ systems of the body. 
These hormones are very powerful. Now, why is cortisol, stress-induced cortisol, so bad for your health? Several pathways are involved. I've just shown a couple here that have real-world implications. First of all, when you have too much cortisol secreted or your pattern of cortisol secretion is screwed up, that, that sets a situation where you have, um, you're laying down more ad, uh, visceral fat in your body, okay? You probably all heard the term visceral fat before. I always go, visceral fat is not this fat you can pinch on your arm, okay? That's subcutaneous fat. It's not this fat you can pinch here, unfortunately, you're right in your stomach. That's visceral fat. That's not the problem. The problem is visceral fat. Visceral fat, I also call angry fat, okay? And visceral fat is internal. You can't pinch it but it bathes your organs. Now the obvious question would be, why is visceral fat so bad? Why is it so angry? Well, it's simple. Visceral fat, unlike the other fat depots in your body, visceral fat actually produces and secretes what are known as inflammatory mediators, okay? And those inflammatory mediators go throughout your body and cause havoc. And that's why visceral fat in particular is bad fat. And we want to minimize the visceral fat. Now obviously, if you have a lot of visceral fat, you want to have some degree of obesity, okay? They go hand in hand. So you don't need anybody with any kind of degree to tell you that obesity is not good for your health, and it's not good for aging slowly, right? So we want to minimize that. And again, so you see the link here between stress and obesity. There's another pathway that I'm going to show you here on how stress, chronic stress, can also play havoc in your overall health and well-being. And that's shown here. All of you know about telomeres probably, but if not, in short, telomeres are those protective ends of your chromosome that prevent your chromosome from unraveling and the cell from dying. It's the exact same as the aglet on the end of your shoelace prevents your shoelace from unraveling. Now with time, your telomeres do shrink naturally. But our goal here in the audience and on stage is to have our telomeres shrink as slowly as possible because we're going to live as long as possible and be as healthy as long as possible, okay? The nexus between stress and telomeres is the REC. There are dozens of papers, most of which by the Nobel laureate winning scientist Elizabeth Blackburn, showing that individuals who are under a lot of chronic stress, whether it's from their occupation, whether it's from life circumstances or whatever, those people under a lot of chronic stress have shortened telomeres in every study, okay? So of all the things that are gonna type of telomeres, and there's several of them as you all know here, obesity, toxins, oxygen, stress, et cetera, the one that we have the most evidence for to really shorten your telomeres fast is chronic stress. And you put these two together, these two pathways, and obviously you're gonna have this situation where you have accelerated aging, okay? So we really need to manage our stress levels. We really need to mitigate the chronic stress. And we need some ways to intervene, nutritionally speaking, or otherwise. Lifestyle, and exercise. Lifestyle. And adaptions are that way that we help mitigate the stress response like that with the IgeNX products. Perfect. Um, and now, uh, switching tunes a little bit, because adaptogens are so multifaceted, um, they also work for performance, mental and physical. Um, so, why don't we uh, talk a little bit about that, the performance enhancing effects. That's a great point, Sarah. So when I think of adaptogens and, and their health providing benefits, I think of a triad. I think of mental performance, physical performance, and then sort of the crux of it is stress management, okay? This slide here shows some of the benefits of adaptogens towards your performance. And we've seen this in clinical studies in humans, actually. So for example, you can see here increased endurance and stamina. That's been shown in some studies with adaptogens and, and athletes. Improved mental performance. That's been shown with cognitive tests and, and assessments. People taking adaptogens do better on certain, certain cognitive tests. See reduction of fatigue. And you remember that I showed on the previous slide how you don't get that exhaustion crash phase after as you're dealing with the stress at the end. And then short recovery time. So these are just a few of the ways that have been clinically shown ways that adaptogens actually help improve your performance, whether mental or physical. And usually they go hand in hand. I mean, when you work out, et cetera, you really need to have, be on the ball, not only physically, but you have to have, be in the right mental state of mind as well. 
especially if you're a serious trainer. Perfect. All right, let's get to the part of the talk that you all probably been waiting for. No offense. The products, right? The different uh, isogenics products that have adaptogens. So, let's start with Ionic Supreme. Break it down. Okay, so as you see here, we have Ionic Supreme. I'm going to talk about three adaptogen rich products, of course, that we have beverages. Ionic Supreme is the first isogenics adaptogen rich beverage, as you all know, probably. It's, it's a sensory potent antioxidant, adaptogen rich beverage, it supports chronic stress ma management. Okay, it should, it's full of adaptogens, that's the main ingredients. And because it supports chronic stress management, by definition it's going to help support healthy aging. Okay, if you remember the last two, two slides ago. Now what are the main ingredients of the Iron Supreme? And this is just, of course, a few of the ingredients, but these are the main ones. We have wolf berry, also known as goji berry, which is a potent antioxidant berry. And then we have three different adaptogens. Do you remember the Second slide where I told you the four main adaptogens. The Iron Supreme has three of them. Okay, so we have ashwagandha, Indian ginseng. We have Siberian ginseng with Rococcus endicosis. And we have rhodiola. Okay, a perfect mixture of three very potent and well researched adaptogens. And we throw in some B vitamins for energy and some zinc for cell maintenance and overall health. And you have a really good preparation, a concentrate, if you will. Okay, and then we have some suggested uses on how to use this product, Ion Supreme. And this is a great one to have every day. And you know, people always ask, do I take it in the morning? Do I take it before I go to bed? And because we all have naturally different stress responses, some of us are a little high strung, others a little bit low, more chill, um, it's, it's going to have a different effect. So some people swear by their ionics right when they get up. It helps give them energy, wakes them up. Other people like it before they go to bed because it helps them sleep better. So you're going to find that everybody is going to have their different use of Ionic Supreme. But the main thing is really th this is your daily drink. Um, and it's, you should just take it. And like here, take it with your shake. Take it um, as a shot. I like to make mine as like a tea warm. So it, it really is, you take it, you make it your own, but you just, you get it in your body every day, and that, that's the main point. So moving on then to... Can I, ask, can I ask the audience, how many of you prefer your ionics as a liquid versus powder? Let's go, how many prefer the liquid more? Wow. wow. How, how powder many heaps? The powder? powder heaps? Yeah. Oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> this one's 50-50. Okay. How about hot versus cold? Is there a preference for hot? Hot. Uh, yeah. Cold? Okay, so oh, more cold. Right. And how many people add it to their shake? Okay. How many people add wow. everything in? Like clan? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Perfect. There's no wrong or right way, really. Yeah, so this is, again, this is our first product, and this is, this is standard bear, right? This is the everyday use once or twice a day, as Sarah mentioned. Now we move on to a really novel, unique product that we developed, E Plus Shot, okay? This is really, this is a great, great uh, innovation here. Um, as it says, it's a natural energy shot supporting mental physical performance, okay? And the main ingredients of the plus shot are green tea extract and yerba mate. Now what do those two ingredients provide in the shot? Don't be shy. Caffeine. Right. Yerba mate and green tea extract are natural sources of caffeine in the shot. Okay? That's it. There's no synthetic caffeine, obviously. It's a naturally sourced. And it's a moderate amount. You know, a lot of these energy drinks out there pour in like two to three hundred milligrams, which is too much to take in a little shot. So with the E, plus, it's about a cup, like a, the equivalent of a cup of coffee. So it's very moderate in caffeine. Yep. And the third and, and essential ingredient that makes each shot what it is also is what's known as the Lear adaptogens. Now, the Lear adaptogens include most of the four major adaptogens I've been talking about, but there are also some other adaptogens in this blend. And this is the preferred blend actually developed by Dr. Breckman. Okay, so you remember I talked with Dr. Breckman earlier, the father of adaptogenic research. The Lear blend is sort of his doing. And that was his idea of the mixture of adaptogens to use, and we're using that in E plus shot. So that's really exciting, actually. We're using the cream of the crop there. And then suggested use, 
use as a morning booze or afternoon pickup. And here again, people are probably going to have their own personal preference, right? I know plenty of people who swear by these before their workouts, and it's great for that. Um, and the really interesting thing about this product and why it's so different from other energy shots out there is that blend of just enough caffeine and then the adaptogens. You don't find that. And because they work um, synergistically and they kind of work a lot uh, similar, right, because caffeine is, is, is stimulant. And then the adaptogens being the mental and uh, physical enhancer, it's a really powerful combination. So that's why absolutely take it before your workout. Um, but again, you know, if this could be your cup of coffee maybe to, to get, make you alert, wake you up, or for that afternoon, you know, brain drain, slump, um, whenever you just need that, that pick me up. And then again, too, um, it's just a great way to get daily dose of adaptogens. You know, it's not just about the caffeine and the, the pick-me-up. It, it is about the dose of adaptogens that you're getting. So another great daily product. I agree with all that. Um, yeah, sort of the pre-workout idea of a D-plus shot sort of came to me out of the blue. I wasn't anticipating that would be a major use of it, but we've heard so many people say, my workouts just go better when I take a shot beforehand. So. Well, and think about it too, there is a, there's a lot of uh, research behind caffeine in athletes. It's very well studied and it's very well known to have an a enhancing effect for athletes. And then same thing with adaptogens. So it's just, it really is, it's a perfect combination for that. Okay, and so the final adaption rich product that we we'll talk about is T plus chai. Okay, and this is our, I guess it's sort of the newest one. Um, what is it? Obviously it's an adaption rich tea. There's a calming effect, and part of that is probably because of the amino acid in the black tea, known as theanine, okay? It's a calming amino acid. Increases clarity and cognitive function. Again, the combination of theanine, tea polyphenolics, etc. Boosts antioxidant immune system status. Okay, so this is a wonderful black tea product, and a great way to consume your adaptions as well. And the difference too, you know, where E plus is the caffeine, it's the energizer. This is no caffeine and more of the, you know, the relaxer. Mm -hmm. You can think of it. And um, again, it's it's a great way to get the adaptogens. And like uh, Dr. Gum mentioned in the beginning, adaptogens don't have a toxic effect, meaning that the more you get, the better. So that's why some people wonder, like, is it okay to take all these products? Yes. The more adaptogens you can get in your body on a daily basis, the better it's going to be for you. And then this isn't even the end of adaptogens in the isogenic system. You'll notice they're in Cleanse for Life, um, they're in Product B, so they're interspersed throughout the whole system. But these are our you know, adaptogen specific products. But they're definitely great to take every day, however you like. This is another, I know a lot of people really like to add this one to the shake. The vanilla shake mm -hmm. is really yummy. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I would just conclude um, sort of dovetailing what Sarah just mentioned. Because um, I wanted to get back to that one word that I mentioned way back when, normalize, okay? So what adaptogens do, as I mentioned earlier, they help the system or the body normalize to the situation at hand. And that's why, it might seem contradictory in a way, as Sarah mentioned, that you have adaptions that provide a stimulatory effect, like an E-plus shot, but they also have adaptogen products, including the same adaptions using the Lear blend here, where it has a calming effect. And that's exactly what adaptions do. They help normalize the system. And we actually saw this at, at corporate when we did a study, and we saw some people who hyper-responded to a stress and adaptions worked. We also saw more people than we expected who didn't respond adequately to a stress. They just didn't respond well at all. And guess what? The adapters actually brought those people up to a, a normal level, a good level of response. So we saw it, even clinically, the adapters did exactly what we hoped they would do. And so it's really important to know that adapters just don't bring things down. They also normalize. So if you need some kind of increased response, they will offer that for you as well. So. So who thinks it's a good idea to get adaptions each and every day, in multiple ways? Yes. All right, well that concludes our talk for right now. Um, obviously, come and see us at the Ask Nutritionist booth. We can talk all day long about adaptogens and answer any other questions you have. Um, check out the website, Facebook, all that. Um, so thank you, Dr. Gunk, you did a very good job.